How's everybody doing? Can you guys hear me okay? It's been a while since I've done something like this, so kind of excited about it, but also curious to see how it's going to go. So everybody say hello and give us a shout out. Let you know, let us know where you're watching from today. Uh, I got a lot to talk about. I'm excited to dive into this one because I just finish, uh, finished a biography of General Patton. So I'm excited to share some of what I've learned and uh, for us to have a conversation about it, about all this. Cody, uh, I would say an hour to an hour and a half at most. It definitely won't be any longer than that. It really just kind of depends on how long it goes and, and how our discussion goes. Uh, if it seems like we've kind of talked through everything and it doesn't take that long, then fine, but it definitely won't go any longer than that. Um, but yeah, hey, Martin, how's it going in Tennessee? Cody, McDowell County, awesome. Nolan in D.C., very cool. I've got my uh, my Mountain Dew Zero here that probably will look weird on the green screen because it always does. Marco, watching from the city where World War I started. Awesome. Hey, in Poland. Steven in Pennsylvania, very cool. So uh, we're going to kind of dive right in, and let me just kind of give you a little bit of an overview of how this is going to go and kind of set the, the ground rules, so to speak. Uh, I'm just going to start talking uh, through the life of General Patton. We're going to look at some pictures. Uh, we're going to watch some videos. Uh, we'll look at some clips from the movie and talk about how that compares to real life. Um, we'll, we'll be looking at from some different sites just to kind of guide the discussion. I've got some notes that I took from when I was going through his biography. Um, the only thing I'm going to ask from you guys is that if you throw questions my way, first of all, keep it on topic. So don't ask me what my favorite battle of the Civil War was because we're, we're talking about General Patton today. So I want to keep the focus on George S. Patton, on his life, on his family, on whatever we're talking about. The other thing I ask is that we keep uh, the questions and the discussion focused on what part of history we're talking about. So when we're talking about General Patton's involvement in World War I, uh, don't throw out a bunch of stuff about the Sicily campaign in 1943. Um, we're, we want to try to focus this a little bit. We will get to the World War II stuff, which is I know what everybody knows the best, but there's a lot of Patton's life that uh, goes before World War II that's worth talking about. So um, hello in Belgium. Awesome. Very cool. Thank you, Insane, for that. Congratulations. Hit 32,000 on the gaming channel today, 18,000 uh, on this channel. So exciting about that. Cody, that's awesome. Um, so yeah, help, help us push to get to 20,000. Uh, we did about 450 new subscribers yesterday. Brandon, hello in Georgia. Hope it's warmer there. Oh, and Nike also in Atlanta. Cyprus, very cool. New Jersey, we're all over the place. So um, did my wife make me shave? No. Um, I preach on Sunday mornings at church, and I usually shave before before church. So, yeah, that's I shaved last night, actually, uh, knowing I'd be doing church camouflage. Thank you. Uh, I'm excited to dive in. There's a lot I learned about Patton that I did not know, and I considered myself kind of knowledgeable on General Patton, but there's a lot I didn't know. So, um, so let's dive in, and let's talk a little bit first about Patton's uh, lineage, because this is important, because it's a big part... Uh, and Cody, don't worry if you if you can't be here for the whole time because um, all of this will be on the channel uh, after it's over. So anything you miss, you'll be able to catch. Um, but Patton's heritage matters because it's a big part of who he was. His identity was very much linked to his history. Uh, he was very mindful of that and was constantly living up to or trying to live up to his heritage. So it's important we talk a little bit about that heritage. And it really begins with uh, two men. One is Robert Patton. And Patton is not the family name. Uh, his ancestor, I think it was his great-great-great-grandfather who came from Scotland, changed the name to Patton. We don't know what the name was before that. Um, but he had left under some kind of shady circumstances. He had left Scotland. And when he came to America, he changed his name to Patton. The, uh, the other, Natalia, hello in Poland. Uh, the other person we want to talk about is also a Scottish immigrant ancestor, and that is Hugh Mercer. Now, Hugh Mercer is the great-great-grandfather, I think, might be three greats, uh, of General Patton. Born in 1726, died in 1777, killed in action during the American Revolutionary War. He was a close friend 
of George Washington. And Hugh Mercer was with Washington uh, when they uh, captured Trenton. He was a big part of that. If you watch the movie The Crossing, Hugh Mercer is one of the primary people that's in that movie. Very good movie. Highly recommend it. Uh, he fought in uh, the rebellion involving uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie, and he was at the Battle of Culloden uh, when Charles's army was defeated in 1746. And because he was on the losing side, he fled to America. Uh, so Hugh Mercer comes to America, and um, I'm just kind of keeping an eye on the chat while I'm talking about this. Uh, Hugh Mercer comes to America, uh, ends up becoming a general, a brigadier general in the American Revolutionary War. He dies uh, at the Battle of Princeton. He was actually uh, knocked off his horse and bayoneted to death at the Battle of Princeton. This is about a week after uh, the victory at Trenton. Uh, so uh, lots of counties. In fact, um, I was married in Mercer County, Pennsylvania. My daughter was born in Mercer County, Pennsylvania, which is just across the border from where I live. Uh, many states, including Ohio, have a Mercer County, and they're named after Patton's great-great-grandfather, uh, Hugh Mercer. So, uh, yeah, Phil, I am out of the basement. I'm up here in the kind of the closest thing to the attic. This is our loft, which is above our garage. It's right off to the side of our bedroom. Uh, my wife is actually loudly snoring in the next room, taking a nap, but she's got earplugs in, so she can't hear me talking right now. Um, so three bad, I didn't see uh, your question. Uh, yeah, I'm not gonna answer that question. As I mentioned at the beginning of this stream, um, keep your, your questions confined to what we're talking about. Uh, so we're talking about George Patton, and uh, we're talking about right now his early life and his uh, his uh, heritage. So uh, I'm just honestly just going to ignore any questions that don't have something to do with what we're talking about today. This is a um, this is a discussion about something very specific. So my wife kicked me out. Ah, eh, kind of. She knew I was streaming today. So so then looking down, Hugh Mercer has a daughter. Uh, her name's Ann Gordon Mercer, and she marries. Uh, this Robert Patton, who came from Scotland, and their son is John M. Patton. John Mercer Patton uh, served briefly as the acting governor of Virginia. He was a politician. He was in. Uh, he was a congressman. Served in the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, was a lawyer, a judge. Uh, politics also runs very deep in General Patton's family. Uh, his grandfather was the second ever uh, governor of Los Angeles. Uh, in fact, Mount Wilson in Los Angeles, we'll take a look at that here in a little bit, is named after General Patton's grandfather. And uh, uh, so then John M. Patton has a number of sons. In fact, I think, I want to say that there were seven sons altogether, uh, seven brothers who all were in the Confederate Army during the Civil War uh, of these this Patton family. And one of them is George S. Patton Sr., who is uh, General Patton's grandfather. So this is him here. And uh, uh, George Smith Patton, he's born in Fredericksburg, Virginia, raised in Richmond. Uh, he goes to Virginia Military Institute, which, again, is a, um, a big legacy in the Patton family. Uh, General Patton went there for a year as well. Um, he graduates from Virginia Military Institute, ends up becoming a uh, colonel, 22nd Virginia Infantry. He's killed at the Battle of Opaquan Creek. Uh, which is in Winchester. His brother, Waller Patton, was killed in Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg, so that was General Patton's great uncle. Um, in fact, you see in the movie Gettysburg, um, Ted Turner, who uh, was the guy who made the movie, um, plays General Patton, and you see a scene where he's coming across a fence and he gets shot in the chest right after he jumps over the chest, uh, jumps over the fence. That's uh, Waller Patton. So three bad, please no. Uh, this is a discussion about General Patton. Uh, we will do that kind of discussion another time if you want to talk about World War II or you can head over to Discord. Uh, we have a World War II channel over there, but that's um, that's what we're talking about today. Um, so this is the legacy of General Patton. Um, so he dies. His son, also named George S. Patton, is called George S. Patton Jr. Uh, originally, uh, but... General Patton would, would call himself George S. Patton Jr. Um, were all the Pattons Confederates? Yes. Everybody on General Patton's side, um, all his family were Confederates. Uh, so then this is his father, George S. Patton, born in uh, 1856. So he really didn't know his father all that well. He's about eight years old when his father was killed 
and uh, had been at war for a couple of years. So I didn't really know him. He also goes to Virginia Military Institute. Um, but they live in Los Angeles in Southern California. And they settled there very, very early. And uh, the Patton family was pretty wealthy. They, they hit, hit some setbacks along the way. Uh, but very, uh, but by and large, uh, very wealthy family. Um, I forgot to mention, too, that Hugh Mercer, the great-great-grandfather of General Patton, um, was also in the Braddock Expedition, which was with George Washington all the way back to those early uh, days. So, hey, guys, how's it going? Um, but, uh, how, uh, Luis, good to see you again. Max, how's it going? Um, so, so we talked a little bit about this, and now we're on to his father. Uh, his father owns some vineyards. He's a very active Democrat in politics. He serves as the L.A. County District Attorney. Um, George Patton, growing up, he's born in 1885. Uh, he's very close to his father. Always had a very good relationship with his father. Had a good relationship with his mother, too, but wasn't nearly as close to her as he was to his father. And you can tell that General Patton kept a diary. And so a lot of what we know comes from his diary. Um, but his father serves as the mayor of San Marino, California. He tried to run for Senate, uh, was unsuccessful in that. Uh, his grandfather uh, is who Mount Wilson is named after, as I mentioned earlier, uh, on his mother's side. And uh, thank you, Insane, for that reminder for everyone. Uh, thank you, Jim Bob Steves, for subbing. I appreciate that. And anybody who's in the chat, if you haven't already subscribed, please do so. Uh, and thank you. And if you have questions as we're going along, uh, as long as they're on topic, please feel free to share your questions. So he grows up in Southern California. And very early on, it's apparent that young George Patton has a learning disability. We would know it today as dyslexia, but they didn't know what to call it then. A lot of times they um, they diagnosed a kid as just being not very intelligent. And there was nothing wrong with George Patton's intelligence. He just had a learning disability. He, he didn't see words the right way. And, and he, he actually struggled really hard to overcome that, but he was always a very poor speller. And you can see that there are certain words that he never learned to spell right. And all throughout, or maybe it wasn't even that he couldn't spell it right, he just couldn't see it right. Uh, so he has dys dyslexia. Uh, his father was not in the military. He attended the Virginia Military Institute, but he, he I don't believe he was ever actually in the military. Um, but George, from a very early age, pretty much always wanted to be in the Army. Um, it was always what he wanted it was always what he sought after. It was always what he understood he was going to be. Because of this long history of military service in his family, he really never considered doing anything else. Um, excuse me. But he, he was a very intelligent kid, an avid reader. Even with his learning disability, he loved to read. And it was primarily histories, and specifically military histories, that he reads a lot growing up. And one of the... Uh, the frequent visitors to the family home was John Singleton Mosby, who was a Confederate general. And uh, so he would hear these stories from John Mosby, who was a good family friend. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, Padascos. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's one of those things that people just didn't fully understand back then that we understand so much better now. But at the time, people would have just been, found that he was had a trouble had trouble learning, and they didn't really fully under, understand what it was. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna refer from time to time to the Wikipedia. Uh, all of this stuff's pretty well sourced, so I know Wikipedia gets a bad rap, but it's pretty well sourced. And um, and, I, and I'll kind of compare this all against my own mental notes from what I did in reading the biography. Um, but you can see here he loved reading about Hannibal, Scipio Africanus, Julius Caesar, Joan of Arc, Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, and Patton always had this belief that he, uh, he believed in reincarnation. He, it's interesting because he was a Christian, uh, Episcopalian specifically, but he also kind of added to his Christian faith with the idea of reincarnation. And he believed that he had been in these other wars following people like Julius Caesar uh, and Hannibal, and that he had fought in these wars. And so when he eventually goes to uh, Europe and to Africa in World War One and World War Two, he has this overwhelming sense that he's been there before fighting in these wars. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, and we're going to talk, Lauren, we're going to look at some clips from the movie about Patton and kind of talk about what's real from the movie. And, and the movie actually gets a lot. 
All right, guys, I apologize. I think we might be back. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, my internet went down at my house. <laughs> I don't know what in the world happened there, but my internet just stopped working altogether. Um, so I think we're back now. Okay, cool. Apologies for that. Uh, not entirely sure what happened there. So where were we? Um, so we uh, we were talking about Patton's early life. And uh, yeah, so he believed in this reincarnation, this idea that he'd fought with these other people. And, and so he always uh, wanted to serve in the military. But he, um, he struggled because of his learning disability on whether or not he was going to be able to get into West Point. And so uh, as a teenager, he, he had a private school education uh, because of the wealth of his family. But his family was struggling financially, and so they were looking for alternatives. And... Um, so he actually ends up briefly going to Virginia Military Institute like his father, his grandfather, uh, and others before him. Uh, but Virginia Military Institute was not a guarantee of a uh, military career, of, a, of an off being an officer, certainly not being a general, which is what he always wanted. He always had this, uh, this desire that he would at least get to the rank of lieutenant general. Uh, my wife unplugged the router. Um, so he wrote about this in his diary as a teenager, wanting to at least be a lieutenant general someday. Um, it's stuttering now. Oh, you got to be kidding me. All right, this is fun. Okay, so I'm switching over to um, to a different frequency on my on my router. So, <laughs> doing my best patent impression by not having the internet. I switched over to uh, from the five gigahertz to the two gigahertz. We'll see if that makes it any better for my Wi-Fi. All right, I messed up. <laughs> I think we should be good now. It's kind of weird that that, that was the case. but um, So he, he goes to Virginia Military Institute hoping that... Oh, yeah, NSA Surveillance. That's the name of our internet connection. Uh, I did that. Uh, he's hoping that VMI will help him get into West Point, which is where he really wants to go. Um, and so he goes to VMI for a year, and then he's actually able to... Um, get and an, uh, I think it was a meeting with one of the senators from California who ends up selecting him to go to West Point. Uh, he actually had risen to the top of his class as a freshman at VMI and was doing really, really well at VMI. Uh, it, it really stood out. And so he goes to West Point uh, and his first year uh, at West Point does not go the way that he hoped it would. Uh, he actually has to repeat his first year at West Point, uh, which is interesting because later on his own son, George Patton, uh, George Patton IV would also have to repeat his first year at West Point. Um, so yeah, so he, he repeats his first year at West Point, uh, but he ex ends up getting selected as second corporal uh, at West Point, uh, which means that he is uh, the second in command of their class at West Point. And that means that he's got a lot of discipline, a lot of um, authority. And that means that among a bunch of potential officers, he's already rising to the top. 
Uh, so he kind of flunked West Point. I mean, he, he didn't really flunk. He just had to repeat his first year because he didn't do well in some of the classes. Again, probably goes back to his dyslexia. Uh, it's not because he, he, he wasn't a good soldier. Uh, so he, he gets po- appointed as second corporal. But George Patton is so much about discipline that he ends up being too hard on the other, uh, on the other uh, classmates. And he gets bumped down to sixth corporal. Because of how hard he was with the discipline, nobody liked him, and they didn't want him to be in charge anymore. Um, so he gets bumped down to sixth corporal. Uh, he plays on the football team at West Point, but he he practices so hard that he keeps getting hurt. He uh, ends up uh, breaking a number of bones, uh, and he realizes that he can't play football because he's injuring other people. He's injuring himself. And so, uh, yeah, he, we're going to talk about his Olympic athlete uh, thing in just a minute. So West Point, Luis, is our military academy. Uh, if you want to be an officer in the United States Army, uh, for the most part, most people who want to be officers in the Army go to West Point. Uh, and that goes all the way back to most of the major generals, or most of the generals in the Civil War on both sides are West Point graduates. All of our uh, the vast majority of the people who rise to become generals in the American army are West Point graduates. So he, he's at West Point. He decides he can't play football because he's playing too hard. So he goes to the track team and he's very good at that. He also is good with the broadsword. He's an excellent swordsman. And there'll be more about that later on. Um, Patrick, very cool. But um, it's in the, in the process of learning uh, everything at West Point and uh, becoming an athlete that eventually he gets the opportunity after uh, West Point where he gets to, um, gets to be an Olympic athlete. So we'll talk about that. Yeah, it's in New York. It's about an hour north of New York City is where, New York, uh, or where West Point is. Torsk, that's okay if you're in and out because uh, this will all be live later on on the channel. You'll be able to watch it later. Um, so another thing that happens at West Point, Patton was incredibly insecure. I mean, people don't realize, because people think of George Patton as this tough, larger-than-life, kind of mean SOB that didn't mess around, wore pistols and fought hard. Patton was an incredibly insecure person. I mean, throughout his whole life, he struggled with insecurity. That whole thing he did where he acted tough was an act. It was something he did because he felt he had to do it as, as an officer in the military to gain the respect of his men. But inside, he was very insecure, and he constantly struggled with feelings of inadequacy and wondering whether he was up to what he was doing. And so it's while they're at West Point, he's actually... Um, one of the people who's in charge of switching out the targets while people are doing target practice. And so he's down range where the guys are firing and he's, he's down low. And when they would stop firing, they would stand up, switch out the targets, get back down low again. And he finds himself wondering how he would be under fire. And in these insecurities, he's afraid that he'll, he'll be afraid when he gets under fire, if he ever gets in combat and he's not sure how he'll react. So he starts popping his head up while they're shooting just to see how he'll handle uh, being in the line of fire. And he finds that he actually actually handles it pretty well. But this is just one of many times that Patton kind of acts reckless because he's trying to push the limits. He's trying to see what he's capable of. He's trying to understand how tough he is. Um, but yeah, we're going to get to World War I uh, here in a little bit. He did believe in reincarnation, Adrian. That's right. Um, yeah, and, and West Point is not just Americans. Uh, when I visited West Point last year, uh, there's a lot of uh, folks from other uh, nations who send people to be educated at West Point as well. Uh, in fact, they uh, you can see there's a whole stretch of houses and they have flags hanging out in front from the different nations that the people are a part of. Um, so he does that at West Point. Uh, he ends up uh, being a very good... Uh, student at West Point, uh, despite his military issues. But it's while he's at West Point then that he meets Beatrice Ayer, uh, who is the daughter of this wealthy family in Boston, um, even wealthier than his own family. 
And this gives him some more political connections and connections are going to define Patton's life because he, he gets connected with all the right people um, in the aftermath of West Point. Uh, yeah, I, I think even Canadians, yes. Uh, yeah, Adrian, we talked about that, how he had to repeat his first year at West Point. His son did also. Um, so, uh, yeah, OCS, uh, Chris, is another way. Officers Candidate School is a way. Um, Patton is one of my favorite generals, yes. Not one of my favorite people, um, Liam, and we'll talk about that. Patton's, Patton's not a real good dude in some areas of his life. Uh, he had some real negative parts of his character, but we'll talk about that as we go along. Um, so he graduates from West Point and he goes to the cavalry. Cavalry is perfect for Patton uh, because he's a great swordsman. He loves the pageantry of cavalry. Uh, he ends up getting uh, appointed to uh, Fort Myer, Virginia, with, which is right outside of Washington, D.C. It's, it's basically right next to Arlington National Cemetery. Uh, and so Fort Myers is a great place to be if you want to make connections uh, because that's where a lot of the senior leadership uh, of the Army is. Uh, yeah, he was a racist. We're going to talk about that. Um, and Adrian, uh, slow down. You're getting ahead of me, man. We're going to talk about that. Um, so he goes to Fort Myer. Uh, he gets himself stationed in D.C. and he ends up an aide to Leonard Wood, who is at the time he's the... Um, the general in chief is the army chief of staff. He's the, the top general in the U.S. Army. So it's a perfect connection for him to make. He also, uh, because of his, his wife and, and the family connections that he has in politics, um, kind of gets welcomed into society in D.C. And among other people, he meets Henry Stimson, who is the secretary of war. Not only secretary of war at that time, but eventually becomes secretary of war again during World War II. Um, so, yeah, so uh, guys with insecurities getting into the cavalry. Uh, so he's making all the right connections, and this is really, really important for him. And it's through these connections that then he uh, is, through his army service, uh, sent to Stockholm, Sweden, to be in the 1912 Olympic Games. Uh, and you can actually see, here's a picture of Patton here uh, on his horse uh, when he's practicing. This is a few years after. Uh, the Olympics, but you can see at this point he's already balding. Uh, at this point he's like 29 years old, but he was in the what was called the modern pentathlon. Uh, so it's a mix of different things: uh, swimming, fencing, the pistol range, riding a horse, a foot race, and he does really, really well. And he probably would have gotten a medal, except when it came to the pistol range. Uh, mostly everybody else was using a 22 on the pistol range, and he was using a 38, which was his U.S. Army-issued pistol. Uh, and the argument that he made was that he actually hit some of the same spots twice, and because of the caliber of the bullet was so big, you couldn't tell the difference. And they said that two of his shots actually missed altogether. And so his score in the pistol range brought him down to fifth place. But he was still the highest scoring non-Swedish competitor. Uh, the top four were all from Sweden, and then he was fifth. So he very well could have gotten an Olympic medal if not for the issue with the shooting. Um, but that's just how it goes sometimes. And uh, yeah, <laughs> not something you wanted to be close to. Here's another uh, picture. This is actually Patton. Uh, in the Olympics during the fencing competition. So this is kind of a cool picture uh, to be able to see. Um, so he, he makes a lot of connections there as well. Uh, and one of the things that Patton then ends up doing uh, as a member of the military is he actually designs the new cavalry saber. And here it is right here. The 1930 cavalry saber, the Patton saber, which was designed by George S. Patton. Uh, he also uh, ended up being... Uh, made kind of the chief uh, sword expert for the for the U.S. Army, uh, and he was actually I think sent west somewhere to train people in sword combat. Uh, but then eventually he gets appointed after he gets married. Uh, he gets appointed um, with Troop A of the Eighth Cavalry, and and here's where one of the uh, the most important things that we all know about his life comes in. Uh, his gun goes off accidentally one night in a saloon because he's got it in his belt. And so he swaps out his Army-issued gun for ivory-handled Colt 
uh, single action army revolvers. And those are what he'd wear for the rest of his life. All those famous pictures of him wearing those um, those ivory handled revolvers that became such a part of him, uh, of his image. Uh, Dylan, hey, awesome. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you, uh, you, you find me to be so. Padas goes, I don't know that the modern pentathlon still involves fencing, but fencing is still in the Olympics. Um, so um, Stormtrooper, uh, Trooper, we'll get to that someday, but not what we're talking about today. So, um, so yeah, so now Pancho Villa expedition. Uh, at this time, Pancho Villa is in Mexico and he actually makes raids across the Mexican border into the U.S., and kills a number of American citizens, I think, in New Mexico. And so they put together what's called the uh, Pancho Villa Punitive Expedition, which is a military expedition where we're going to send the U.S. military into Mexico to hunt down Pancho Villa. And John J. Pershing is put in charge of this because he's one of the few uh, U.S. Army officers with um, significant experience in things like this. Uh, because he had been involved in the Spanish-American War. John Pershing actually was at the Battle of San Juan Hill, uh, fighting very close to uh, Theodore Roosevelt. And then, of course, he was sent to to the Philippines uh, to put down insurrection there. So, So Pershing's put in charge of this expedition, but Patton's unit is not supposed to be a part of the expedition. So Patton really wants to fight, and he knows that if he's ever going to achieve becoming a general, he's got to get combat experience. And, and it doesn't seem at the time like the United States is going to get involved in World War II or World War I. So he's looking for combat experience and, and he's a very ambitious guy, even though he's very insecure. Constantly at war within Patton is his ambition and his insecurity. And those are always coming head to head. Uh, so he, he tries to get appointed to this expedition and he's told no. And so he tries to get Pershing to appoint him as a personal aide and Pershing finally relents. And there's actually this this interesting thing that happens where uh, Patton goes and asks Pershing if he can be on his staff and Pershing initially doesn't, you know, he says, everybody's asking to be on my staff. Why should I let you? And he said, well, I want it more than everybody else. Well, the next morning Pershing calls Patton and he says, how long will it take you to be ready? And he says, I'm ready now. I packed my bags already. And that it really impressed General Pershing. And so Patton gets to be on Pershing's staff as an aide. Uh, and he acts as his personal courier. And again, here's connections. He's got connections to all the right people. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about this 1915 Dodge in just a minute. And yeah, he was allowed the gun, Lauren, um, as far as I know. So... Um, but um, so he, he gets appointed to this expedition. He ends up being one of the people who gets involved in combat during this. And his first combat experience becomes the first motorized attack in the history of the U.S. military. And what he used was right there, the 1915 Dodge. Uh, so he gets a bunch of soldiers on the Dodge and they use it to go in to this attack on this compound where they believe Pancho Villa might be. He wasn't there, uh, but he kills some of Pancho Villa's men. And uh, he shoots several of them. Whether or not he killed any of them, we don't know. But they consider that the first motorized warfare in the history of the U.S. military because rather than riding in on a horse, he rides in on this 1915 Dodge. Uh, So kind of uh, an interesting thing that was happening there. Uh, He he was a maniac. Uh, Pedascos, I can't argue with that. Um, so that gives him his first combat and this makes national headlines and George Patton is on the cover of newspapers all over the country. Uh, so, so right away he, he's making a name for himself and he's, uh, he's earning, uh, the reputation that he would eventually become. So, so then he, he's promoted to first Lieutenant. Uh, he's, he's like over 30 years old now. He's, I think, 32 years old at this point, and he's only a first lieutenant. Uh, it's slow going in the military, but then an opportunity comes with World War One, And so the American Expeditionary Force is being assembled. John J. Pershing is selected to be the general-in-chief of the American Expeditionary Force, and he's putting together a staff. 
and he only takes 180 people as his advance party to go over and start setting up their headquarters in 1917 to start observing what's happening in the war. And Patton is one of the people that is selected in this first 180 men who goes to Europe, and he's promoted to captain. Uh, because, again, he's very ambitious, and he pushes to get on Pershing's staff. Now, it doesn't hurt that Patton's sister is engaged to Pershing at this point. So, um, yes, Adrian, we're going to get to that. Um, yes, uh, he and MacArthur did, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. They do, they do uh, cross paths at Saint Mihail uh, during World War I on the same battlefield. Um, would Patton have been as efficient in the Civil War Revolution? Absolutely, because uh, his attitude and his mindset for warfare, I think, would have worked in any time. Um, so, uh, so his sisters engaged to Pershing. Pershing had very tragically lost his wife and three of his four children in a house fire in San Francisco, uh, right around the time of the Pancho Villa expedition uh, back in California while he was in Texas. And so he meets Patton's sister, Nita, and gets engaged to her. They never got married because of the war kind of separated them uh, and things kind of fell apart after that. Uh, but he goes as, as Pershing's personal aide uh, over to uh, World War I. So Arisha, not talking about that today. Just a reminder, everybody is insane saying we're keeping all the discussion and all the questions to George Patton today. That's what we're talking about. Um, so any other questions, uh, just not today. It's in World War One that Patton learns about tanks and he sees tanks in action for the first time and he realizes that this is the future of warfare. And he's actually in the hospital uh, with a case of jaundice. And uh, he was he was going, he had an opportunity, he had the choice to take command of an infantry battalion or to go into tank warfare, which was brand new. And this is one of those important moments in Patton's life where he makes a decision that will change the trajectory of his life. Uh, he, he gets talked into the tanks by this man, Colonel Fox Connor. I didn't mean to click on Colonel. I meant to click on Fox Connor there. Uh, so Fox Connor uh, is an American who rises to uh, Major General eventually. Um, and they call him the man who made Eisenhower. But he convinces Patton that tanks are where it's at. Plus, there's not many officers in the tank corps. So there might be opportunity to rise quicker in the ranks, which is what Patton's after. You know, there are lots of battalion commanders in the infantry. There aren't many battalion commanders in the tank corps. Uh, so he goes for tanks. And, uh, yeah, uh, he chooses the tanks. He's assigned to the Light Tank School uh, in November of 1917. Uh, and he starts training with the French Army's Renault tanks. Uh, and, and they see uh, the impact that tanks are starting to have, especially the British and French tanks. Uh, so he ends up being put in command of an entire tank brigade. Uh, and he was one of those people who he's defining what tank warfare is going to look like for the American military because this is brand new in the history uh, of the military. And so he, he ends up getting promoted to lieutenant colonel and then eventually to full colonel. Um, and this is a big jump after only being a first lieutenant at the beginning of the war. And yeah, it's, it's during uh, the battle, uh, the, the uh, Sami Hill uh, offensive, that he runs into Brigadier General Douglas MacArthur on the battlefield. Uh, and the History Channel, I think, did this scene with that. Um, I'll show it to you, even though it's got a lot of things wrong with it. Um, like, one of the things they have wrong is um, they show Patton on the back of, I think, what is a World War II tank, because there weren't any World War I tanks available for them to film it with. They have him in introducing himself as Lieutenant Patton, even though he's a Lieutenant Colonel, and I think he's still he's wearing Lieutenant Colonel oak leaves. Um, but this is the scene that they show uh, on the History Channel. German line. Now, one of the things they say there is they talk about the intelligence that Patton... Patton would go out and scout the battlefields ahead of time. He actually got his, pat, his pilot license so he could fly. And he would actually fly out over the battlefield to scout it out before he would take his tank brigade in. 
Uh, so he was very much about intelligence and, and scouting the ground and knowing what he was getting himself into before he went in MacArthur the rest of the time. So yeah, <laughs> fake history for some of that stuff for sure. But they did meet on the battlefield. That definitely did happen during the Battle of St. Mihail. Um, but yeah, Patton was very good at uh, adapting to new technology, Shadalak. Uh, he was always wanting to be on the forefront. He was always learning. He was always trying to understand his opponent. Um, and uh, he actually, uh, this is where he first has an incident that people don't talk about much, where he may have actually killed one of his own soldiers. Uh, and, and it actually mentions it here. Um, I, th I think this is where it is. Trying to move his rever reserve tanks forward and losing control of his temper, Patton is quoted as potentially having murdered one of his own men, stating, some of my reserve tanks were stuck by some trenches, so I went back and made some Americans hiding in the trenches dig a passage. I think I killed one man here. He would not work, so I hit him over the head with a shovel. Whether he actually did or not, I don't know. But this is also where he gets wounded and he ends up getting his Purple Heart. Uh, he's... He's in the middle of this tank battle, and he gets shot, and it goes through his leg, his upper left leg, and comes out through his butt, basically. <laughs> um, so uh, he was wounded pretty severely there, but he survived it. Uh, and he said the hole was about the size of a silver dollar when it came out the other side. And it was while he was recuperating from his wound then that he's breveted uh, colonel in the tank corps, but he didn't see any further uh, combat at that point. Uh, he's given the Distinguished Ser Service Medal, the Purple Heart. Um, and uh, I'm just catching up with things here on the chat. Oh, yeah, Wesley, we're going to look at some of those clips from the movie here pretty soon. Uh, did it happen a lot in World War II, Flapjack? I don't think it did. It was pretty rare. Um, I think, honestly... Um, it did happen some in World War II. I think more often than not, you had soldiers killing officers, especially in like Vietnam. I know that happened. Uh, they talked about fragging like incompetent officers, uh, things like that. Um, what's with what World War I game? I don't see a World War I game. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Um, who's my favorite general World War II? It was definitely Patton. So here's Patton just after World War I in 1919. You can see he's got the insignia of a colonel there. Uh, how long is the stream, Jim Bob? We'll probably go till about 4.30, uh, so about another 45 minutes or so. Um, so now, yeah, Adrian, please, we're going to get there, but we all know that you know lots of things about World War II, but stick with where we are, please. Um, so after World War I, uh, you know, as was the case with a lot of guys, they got reduced in rank because... When the the pre-war U.S. Army was about a hundred and thirty thousand, I think, um, plus another seventy thousand or so in terms of um, the reserve. So very small pre-war army. But now you go to a couple million in the army, something like two and a half million, I think, between stateside and in the um, uh, uh, in the European theater. So a lot of guys get promoted quickly. So he goes from lieutenant all the way up to colonel. But now he gets bumped back down to captain. And then the next day gets promoted to major. Not sure why that was, but that's why they did it that way. Uh, so as a major now, uh, he is 30, 33 years old when the war ends, almost 34. Uh, and he gets uh, sent to Camp Meade, Maryland. And, and the, uh, this time after the war is when he meets uh, Dwight Eisenhower. Eisenhower had ster served stateside during the war training um, officers and men. Uh, and actually also had worked with tanks. And so both of these men had something in common with tanks. And they meet uh, because they're stationed right there near Gettysburg uh, in Maryland. And uh, he goes to the General Staff College. Uh, but he keeps getting staff positions. And he doesn't want staff positions. He wants uh, a leadership position, a combat position. He ends up getting sent to Hawaii. Uh, and he and Eisenhower stay in contact. Uh, they become friends. Um, he gets assigned back to the cavalry again. He hates peacetime after having gotten a taste of war. Uh, yes, we're going to get to the Sicilian campaign. We're going to talk uh, through everything uh, once we get to that point. So um, just catching up on the chat and everything. Uh, yes, you and we talked about that. He got fifth in the pentathlon in the Olympics. Um, 
so he rises very, very slowly through the ranks in the in the peacetime military. Uh, this is when his wife and and his family are growing. Uh, you know, he's having several children. Um, I think two daughters. Um, their home, their their main home, was in uh, Hamilton, Massachusetts. I've actually been there. Um, I visited that. It's uh, on the north side of uh, of Boston because that's where his wife's family was from. Uh, he gets pro- uh, posted there for a while. He's the G1 and G2 of the Hawaiian division at Schofield Barracks in Honolulu. So he's, he, he spends a lot of time in Hawaii uh, in the military. Um, and then he's still a major as late as 1932. He spends 12 years uh, in the post-war at, at the rank of major. Um, and so you can see at this point then, uh, he is the executive officer of 3rd Cavalry, which is ordered to Washington by who is now the Army Chief of Staff, Douglas MacArthur. Uh, he takes command of 600 troops of the 3rd Cavalry. MacArthur orders Patton tro- Patton's troop to advance on prote- protesting veterans. Uh, all these veterans of World War I were protesting because they weren't uh, getting the, um, the benefits that they thought they were entitled to uh, as veterans. And, and Patton is ordered as one of the officers who are ordered to basically disperse this um, this protest group. And, and he hated having to do it, but he did it. And he actually burned some bridges with some people that had been dear friends, including a guy who had saved his life uh, during World War I uh, because of that. But he leads the 3rd Cavalry down Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, so here you have future General George S. Patton leading cavalry right down Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. in the 1930s to disperse uh, this protest. And Joe Angelo is the name of this guy uh, who he has contact with again. um, And they kind of have a falling out after this. I'm just catching up on the chat now. Yeah, uh, I mean, there, uh, Corey, unfortunately, that's just the way it was. And the problem for Patton was that he's not getting any younger. He's 32 years old. He's still a major. And at this point, he's almost 50. I mean, he's, he's 47 in 1932. Uh, and he's still a major. So you, you got to, if you're Patton, start to wonder if this is it. And he did wonder that. He felt like he was never going to become a general. He was never, never going to get that opportunity. Uh, but in 1934, at the age of 48, almost 49, he's finally promoted to lieutenant colonel. Um, and he kind of figures that this is as far as it's going to go for him. Uh, but then, of course, here comes World War II. And again, before World War I, he gets promoted to colonel in July, or before World War II, he gets promoted to colonel in July of 1938. Uh, and there he connects with George C. Marshall, who again is the Army Chief of Staff. So he's always making these connections with the right people. And, of course, he has a prior friendship with Eisenhower, and all of this uh, helps. Uh, And so he stays a colonel at this point. And now this is when the Army starts to mobilize rapidly, and this is where things start to happen really quickly for Patton. So... Uh, I'll just kind of briefly go through this because I want to spend the time that we have left talking about World War II. Patton ends up um, getting back into the tanks. Uh, the Army creates the 1st and 2nd Armored Divisions. Uh, and Patton, uh, in 19, I guess 1939, 1940, they're doing uh, these maneuvers for the 3rd Army, which he would eventually command. Uh, and he serves as one of the umpires for the uh, for the maneuvers that they're doing, but he wants to get involved. And so he asks to be put in command of one of these units, and he gets command of the 2nd Armored Brigade of the 2nd Armored Division. Uh, and he gets put in charge of the training, and he instantly, you know, this is Patton's bread and butter. He's good with discipline. He's good with training people. And so he gets promoted to Brigadier General on October 2nd of 1940. He's made the acting division commander in November, and basically from then on out, he ends up the division commander. And so then by April 1941, he's made commanding general of 2nd Armored Division uh, and promoted to the rank of Major General. United beat Newcastle 3-1. Thank you, Insane. Uh, when I saw it, it was tied at 1. Um, so my, my son will be happy about that, and I'm happy about it because Newcastle's down at the bottom, and it keeps somebody else close to my team, West Brom. Um, so Patton uh, is now a major general. He's in command of 2nd Armored Division. 
uh, he eventually then uh, rises again. But at this point, he is the premier armor commanding uh, armor officer in the U.S. military. He's the guy. And armor is going to define World War II. Because by this point, we're seeing what the Germans are doing with Blitzkrieg with armor. And, and the U.S. starts to understand the importance of armor. And Patton is the guy when it comes to, to armor. And he does these huge exercises with large numbers of armor. And he shows what he's able to do. And again, he's using his pilot's license to scout out and observe movements. And he's learning on the fly. He's an incredibly intelligent strategist. And so he's learning as he's doing these maneuvers in the States what works and what doesn't, uh, how to uh, put together an effective armored force. And he gets put on the cover of Life magazine because of this. Uh, because, again, here's a, a guy who's got the fame that goes along with the knowledge. So um, when he gets put into um, to the war, he's actually one of the very first Americans, again, one of the very first to go into World War I. He's one of the very first to go into World War II uh, in the uh, European and African theaters. So he's sent to Africa, and his old friend, Dwight Eisenhower, who's now Lieutenant General, uh, is the uh, Supreme Allied Commander, uh, he's the U.S. commander in Africa at this point. Uh, and he lands as part of what's called Operation Torch in the summer of 1942. And he commanded the Western Task Force, 33,000 men. Uh, they land near Casablanca. It goes pretty smooth. His first combat in World War II is against the French, uh, Vichy France. So he's fighting against, uh, against French troops, not Germans, not Italians, the French. Uh, but he, he very quickly establishes a beachhead. He gets there, uh, does well. Casablanca falls, and he's kind of settles in to kind of a, kind of a political role of having to connect with the uh, with the civilian authorities on the ground, the Sultan of Morocco, people like that. Uh, and that's where the movie opens, the movie Patton. Now. Um, let's talk about the movie uh, for a little bit because the movie gets a lot of things right. One thing it does not get right is Patton himself. Um, I think they get his, his demeanor right. But man, if, you, if, if your picture of George Patton is George C. Scott and you've never seen this, you are in for a surprise, my friends, because this... All right, we back. Let me know if if, uh, if we're back. Sorry about that, guys. We're good? Okay. Awesome. Don't know what happened there. All right, so let's watch this. So this is, uh, if you didn't hear me say that, if it got lost uh, in what was happening, this is narrated by Ronald Reagan, who was an Army officer at the time, and you're going to see Jimmy Doolittle and George S. Patton. This is the summer of 1945. King's words, it didn't hurt America to have a general so bold that he was dangerous. Los Angeles went all out in its reception. With him was General Doolittle, whose Eighth Air Force in Europe did so much to assure final victory. Although no unit, no individual won the war, we're fortunate in having one here tonight with us who had a large part in winning the war. I'm pleased and proud to have been privileged to fight by the side of General George Patton. Your Honor, the Mayor, General Doolittle, soldiers, ladies and gentlemen, coming over here, there was a very great lesson. The first four hours, 
we passed over a destroyed land, utterly destroyed. You who have not seen it do not know what hell looks like from the top. That's what Germany looks like. That's what Austria looks like. That's what any place that the 8th Air Force and the 3rd Army worked on looks like. You must remember this, that from Brest to various towns in southern Germany and Austria, whose names I can't pronounce, but who, whose places I have removed, <laughs> the trail of the 3rd Army and the 19th Tactical Air Command and the 8th Air Force is marked by more than 40,000 white crosses. So there you have, uh, that's just a glimpse of the real General Patton. Yeah, Ronald Reagan was eventually president, but he served in the military working uh, for the army and making films because that was his background. He was an actor. Um, but yeah, you get a little bit of a sense of who Patton was there where he makes that comment about whose names I can't remember but whose places I have removed. And you see that little bit of a smirk uh, with Patton and you get a sense of his personality there with all of that. But uh, let's talk a little bit about... I don't know if he really called him that, but let's take a look at a couple of the clips. Now that you understand that that's not who Patton really was in terms of his voice, let's watch a couple of these clips because I want to show you a couple of clips from the movie Patton that pretty much got it exactly right. Uh, and one of the first ones um, that I want to pull up, a couple from Africa. So this is a scene from when he first arrives in Africa. And this all legitimately did happen. This is not a real good quality example of this video, but this one will work for now. That is a scene, we don't know if it happened exactly like that, but it most definitely did happen. Uh, he comes in after the US gets beat badly in its first real combat in Africa at Kasserine Pass. And so they remove the Corps commander who was responsible for that and he, um, he gets put in command of the, uh, the U.S. Uh, First Corps there, uh, and he immediately institutes discipline, and in less than two weeks, he turns around what was a pretty shabby performance and starts getting success on the battlefield. Uh, and for him, it really came down to this idea of discipline. Uh, the next scene that I want to show you is, uh, and Terry, I think you're alluding to what we're going to talk about next. In this scene that they show in the movie where he's arguing about air, uh, air supremacy. Uh, this happened almost exactly as the movie shows it. Uh, he's frustrated by the fact that, uh, that they're getting strafed by German air, uh, air forces and his higher ups are claiming that they've got complete air supremacy. And so he has this meeting and this happened almost exactly the way the movie shows. Of course, the only thing they get wrong there is he's got the wrong gun. He doesn't have his ivory handled pistols there, but that scene uh, seems like something made for a movie, but it literally did happen that way. They were having a conversation in which the British air commander was telling him, we've got complete air supremacy. And right at that moment, they get attacked. And Patton did say later that he wished he could find the, uh, the Germans who were responsible because he'd give them a medal uh, because they did that perfectly uh, timed. Uh, so yeah, this totally did happen exactly like that. So uh, from that point, uh, he actually gets pulled out of the field uh, in Africa because they want him uh, in charge of the American landings in Sicily. Uh, so he's actually pulled out of command so that he can start planning that command, uh, that fight in Sicily. Oh, geez, you got to be kidding me.
All right, are we back? <laughs> I guess we're not watching any more patent clips. Okay, all right, so we're not going to watch any more clips of the movie. Uh, yes, I got copyright shut down there for that one. Hopefully that doesn't uh, hurt the channel long term, but we'll see. Uh, yeah, it, it was the movie clip. That's totally what did it. Uh, it even said that up on the screen for me. Uh, it says, your stream is no longer being blocked due to copyright issues. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I never had that happen before. Uh, so he gets put in command of the, uh, the Sicily operation. So let's talk about that for a minute. So here's the invasion of Sicily. And uh, Patton's in command of 7th Army. And uh, Montgomery is given the task of landing over here and moving up toward Messina, which is the main target, because that's the kind of the jumping off point then to the mainland. Uh, Patton is given the task of landing to his left and covering his flank. Basically, they figure Americans didn't do so well before Patton. Uh, in Africa, we can't really trust the Americans to have the main job. Let's give it to the Brits. We know they can do it. So, um, what's my favorite quote from Patton? I don't know if I have a favorite quote. Um, and saying, yeah, we'll see how long it takes. Uh, we might have to go a little bit over because of all that. Um, so, what ends up happening then is Patton, he doesn't want no part of being second fiddle to Montgomery or anybody else. Uh, so he decides that rather than just guarding the flank, he's going to show what he can do. So he very quickly kind of deals with all of the rest of Sicily uh, and ends up arriving in Messina before the British get there. I want to scroll down and see if we can find a map that shows a little bit of that. Uh, so the British 8th Army moves up this way. Patton takes all of this, goes up to Palermo, takes all of that, basically conquers the whole island, and then still manages to get up the coast and land uh, at Messina and take Messina before the British can get there. Yes, he beat Monty. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, we'll talk about the slapping incident because those happened on Sicily. So it's on Sicily that these infamous slapping incidents occur. And it's because of these slapping incidents that these are probably the reason Patton doesn't get uh, overall command of U.S. ground forces in Europe. And that instead goes to Omar Bradley. Because Bradley was actually under Patton. He was Patton's um, assistant corps commander uh, in Africa. But then he jumps Patton, and I think it's because of these issues. Patton did not have uh, the the part of his brain that told him, okay, maybe you shouldn't say this. Uh, and some people suspect that it was because Patton had, had repeatedly been kicked by horses, had serious head injuries a number of times in, in earlier years. And by this point, he's 60 years old. And, uh, or he's very nearly 60. He's in his late 50s. And um, so some people think that was why he kind of increasingly got kind of out of control uh, and didn't necessarily play by the book. But Patton, contrary to popular belief, Patton was capable of towing the line and, and doing and playing the political game. Uh, there were, for example, an opportunity in Africa where he thought he was going to get passed over and he would write letters to a general marshal back in the United States. Uh, and very diplomatically pleading his case. Uh, and when he dealt with Eisenhower, at least face to face, he was always very diplomatic, always very deferential to Eisenhower, even though privately in his journal, in his diary, uh, he wrote pretty scathingly about people like Eisenhower who he felt were just not willing to do what was necessary. But publicly and face to face, he could play the game. Uh, so he was capable of that. Uh, when it was higher ups, when it was people below him in the ranks, it was a different story. Um, but yeah, I think Martin, you're absolutely right about that. Uh, it's 4:14 where I am now. 
Uh, somebody was asking about uh, the time. Um, but yeah, Bradley was the anti patent and he definitely was over patent to kind of keep him in control. Um, but anyway, so 1943, uh, Sicily. So what happens is there are these two incidents and the one that they show in the movie uh, was the more severe of the two. Uh, and basically what happens is, and I won't show the clip because we know what will happen. Um, but were they facing, they were, they were facing, a, I think, a mix of Italians and Germans in Sicily. Uh, but I want to say in Sicily it was primary, primarily Italians, but I could be wrong about that. Um, so he, he's, he's, he's in, the, uh, he's in a uh, hospital and he's visiting wounded soldiers who he had great respect for. And they show this scene where he, he's pinning purple hearts on wounded soldiers and he would lean over and he kisses the forehead of one of these men. And uh, he had a great deal of respect for men who, uh, who were wounded or killed. And so he sees this shell-shocked soldier who's in the hospital and he gets really mad and he starts swearing at him and he slaps him with his gloves and orders him out of the hospital saying that he is disgracing this place of honor where these wounded men are, are and he and he orders them to send the man back to the front. And he said, you might get killed, but you're going to go. Uh, and this happened twice. And the this, of course, it was actually kept quiet for a while. Uh, for the most part, the press kind of played along. But eventually word did get out and there was a huge uproar back in the United States because it, it got leaked and it ended up in all the papers and he had to have this big sit down with, uh, with Eisenhower uh, and Marshall left it up to Eisenhower what he wanted to do with Patton and Eisenhower to his great credit even though Patton could be a real headache for him recognized the importance of a man like Patton to the war effort and kept him in command but it did slow Patton's rise through the ranks and it kept him to the place where he was never going to rise above the command of a single army because of these kinds of things. Um, yeah. And Martin, you're right. Uh, as we'll talk about toward the end here, um, Patton would have fit in very well with the Germans when it came to, um, when it came to the Jews. We'll talk about that when we get to that point. Um, but, yeah, Patton got, got sent to the councilor, so to speak. So uh, so they win in Italy, uh, and now um, you know they advance into Italy, but they get stalled in Italy, uh, and now they're going to start preparing for Normandy, for Operation Overlord. And again, Patton gets himself in hot water. He says some things while he's in, uh, in England preparing for all this, and there's this incident where he talks about... Um, how Anglo-Saxons are going to rule the post-war world. And this doesn't sit well with the Russians. It doesn't sit well with all the other people who aren't Anglo-Saxons. Uh, and again, he gets into real trouble because of that. Um, thank you, Flapjack. Appreciate that. Um, and this is all kind of portrayed in the movie as well. But let's go back to... Um, we'll go to, to Patton his Wikipedia just to kind of talk through. I want to make sure I'm not missing anything uh, that we're talking about here. Uh, so Sicily campaign. Uh, and yeah, there was this, uh, the Biscari massacre was a war crime. And this is one of several times that there were massacres under Patton's troops. It happened again during the battle of the bulge uh, in response to the, to the Malmody massacre where uh, men in Patton's 11th armored division uh massacred a number of German soldiers. In this case, it was Italians mostly. Um, so there were a number of incidents like that, and Patton tried to keep them hush-hush as much as he could. And yes, he did want to fight the Russians. Um, so there's the slapping incidents. Uh, in January of 1944, he's formally given command of the U.S. Third Army. But there's this phantom army, because they knew... Uh, over in Germany, people like Lauren, thank you, appreciate that. Uh, people like Guderian, uh, people like Rommel, uh, all thought very highly of Patton as a commander. And for the most part, Gen German high command believed that Patton was the best soldier that the Americans had. Uh, and Montgomery very privately believed the same thing too. 
Patton and Montgomery, though they would never have admitted it publicly, both respected each other as soldiers and both thought highly of each other as soldiers. Patton considered Montgomery one of the best Allied generals there was. There's a, a line in the movie. I don't know if he ever said it or not, but he said, he said, he says to to Bradley, he says, "Of course, I'm a prima donna. I know it. I admit that I am." He said, "My my issue with Montgomery is that he won't admit it." Uh, Montgomery and Patton were both very similar personalities, which is probably why they clashed. Uh, but they both recognized their greatness in one another, even if they would never admit it publicly. Um, so yeah, they they assign Patton to command this fictitious army that's going to land in Calais, which is the shortest distance across the channel. And it, it worked. They created a whole fictitious army. They created a lot of um, chatter, uh, commands going back and forth, uh, everything that made it look like there was a real army with Patton in command. Uh, and Patton even um, was kept in England and his whereabouts were kept private until July of 1944, a month into Operation Overlord, just to keep the Germans guessing about whether or not Patton was still going to land at Calais before they finally sent Patton over once they had established the beachhead and put him in command of Third Army. So, um, let me check. I'm just catching up on the chat now. I think Patton would have done fine. Um, I uh, I understand what you're saying, uh, Christoph Polak. Uh, some have argued, well, of course, Patton did well. He was always on the winning side. He was on the side that was going to win from the beginning. But the way that I would counter that would be to say, look at how he did compared to the other Allied generals. And you compare his performance to, to them. And I think he always did fairly well. Uh, the only time he didn't do so well was when he let his own personal feelings get in the way of the mission. Uh, for example, late in the war when he sent a mission to try and rescue his son-in-law who had been captured by the Germans. Um, Pav, he, he wasn't uh, a good person, uh, unfortunately. Um, uh, we're going to end with his, his death, Adam. Um, Patton was a great general. He was not necessarily a great person. Uh, he was very racist. He hated the Jews. Uh, I, I think if it had let, been up to him, he probably would have left him in the camps. Uh, and he made comments to that effect. Uh, he got in a lot of trouble and eventually lost command of Third Army because he refused to remove Nazis from positions of authority in Germany in the post-war. Um, but uh, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit. Uh, so he's put in command after they've made their initial breakthroughs in Normandy. And he makes this, he's on, uh, if you imagine, let's see if we can find a map um, of Operation Overlord. If you imagine the Allied army landing at Normandy, uh, Pat Patton's basically on the extreme right flank. Uh, as they move forward. Uh, I'm trying to find. Uh, so here you have it. So um, you're going to have kind of this being the, the area where the Allies have taken control. And Patton gets put kind of out here on the right flank. And his job is to drive through central France. Uh, and, and he kind of breaks out and he gets ahead of everybody else. And they have to slow him down uh, because they eventually have to divert uh, gasoline, resources, uh, to Montgomery for what becomes Operation Market Garden in September of 1944. And Patton saw an opportunity where he could have broken through the Siegfried line and probably gotten into Germany in the fall of 1944. Uh, but it, it wasn't to be, unfortunately. So he was a great general uh, and a difficult person, I guess. Um, but uh, he did believe in reincarnation. He believed he had been in the military several times before serving in some of the other great campaigns of history. Um, but uh, let's go back to Patton here. Um, so the Lorraine campaign, uh, his offensive comes to, to a halt right at the end of August, and this is because they're getting ready to launch Market Garden. And 
He did. He was kind of the blitzkrieg of the Americans, uh, and he was pushing really, really fast forward. Uh, but uh, supplies became an issue, and you see, you have this scene where him and Brad, where Bradley tells him, "I'm going to have to slow you down." And, and Patton gets upset, and he says, "You give me 400,000 gallons of gasoline, and I will go to Berlin." And he probably could have. He probably could have broken through. Um, but then he kind of gets slowed down, and that's when the Battle of the Bulge happens, which is the the German Ardennes offensive uh, late in the war, and Patton is one of several generals who come to this meeting with Bradley and Eisenhower and they're asked, can anybody do something? We're trying, you know, they're trying to stop the, the, uh, the advance. They're trying to, to break through and get relief to the 101st airborne and Patton's in the middle of a fight and he's asked and, and, and some of the other generals say, I can't do it. There's nothing I can do. And Patton says, I can attack with three divisions in 48 hours. He's a hundred miles away. And everybody else around the table is shocked by this. And like, you know, and there's a scene in the movie. I don't know if this was actually said, but Bradley turns to him and he says, I'd give myself a little leeway if I were you. And he said, no, I can do it. And he did. He had one division going within 24 hours and I think two more within 48 hours. Uh, And he gets these men pulled out of a major engagement, moves them 100 miles and into an attack. Uh, at Bastogne, all within a couple of days. And it was one of the most incredible feats of the war. Uh, And everybody recognized Patton's greatness at that moment. And one of my favorite scenes, and again, I wish I could show you the scene, because this really did happen. The weather's really bad, and it's slowing down Patton's ability to throw back the Germans because they can't get air cover. They can't get supplies into the 101st Airborne. So he goes to his chaplain, and he gives him an order to write a weather prayer, uh, a prayer for good weather. And the patent, er, the, the chaplain's kind of not sure about this, but he writes the prayer. And uh, Patton issues the prayer to his entire army. He has copies of it made for everybody and issues it to all of them. And the weather does clear up. And Patton gives the, the chaplain the bronze star because of this prayer. And he believes fully that, um, that this prayer is what cleared up the weather. And, and again, I don't know if it's true to the history of it, but in the movie, uh, he's debating with this chaplain about the prayer. And the chaplain says, you know, I don't know how this is going to be received, General. And and, Cha- and Patton says, well, I can assure you, sir, uh, because of my intimate relations with the Almighty, that if you write a good prayer, we'll have good weather. And it happens. And it's just one of those things that have gone down in folklore about Patton, this prayer. And a lot of people to this day have copies of that. And I wish I had asked my uncle, my great uncle, was in a field artillery unit in the 11th Armored Division in Patton's 3rd Army and served under Patton. And I never had a chance to ask him. Uh, he passed away in 2004. Never asked him about whether or not he had a copy of that prayer. So um, let me just catch up with the chat here, guys. Uh, He was absolutely right when you see the outcome of Market Garden. It was a a big mistake, Market Garden was. We probably could have been over the Rhine and into Germany Germany in in late 1944 otherwise, but I don't know for sure. Um, Okay, so uh, long story short, Battle of the Bulge is kind of the high watermark for Patton uh, as far as the war goes. they, they do eventually advance into Germany. Uh, the war ends. And, of course, Patton wants to keep it going because he recognizes that once the war is over, we're going to have to deal with the Russians. He calls them the Mongols. Again, a lot of racism in Patton. Uh, he, other than the British, uh, he by and large looked down on pretty much everybody. He, he looked down on the Jews. He thought they were a lesser people. Oh, no, I, I should say the Germans also. He, he considered the Germans the only civilized people on mainland Europe. Um, he thought that the Russians were just a bunch of uneducated thugs. Uh, and he felt that we were going to have to fe- face them eventually. So he said, we might as well take them on while we've got the army here to do it. Uh, and a lot of this attitude got him into real trouble at the end of the war. Um, so... Uh, post-war, he gets promoted to four stars uh, as a general. His son-in-law, John Waters, uh, was being held in a Nazi uh, prison camp. Uh, he was a POW, and he sends this task force bomb 
uh, in late March 1945 to go to go um, break his son-in-law out of prison. And basically he sends them 100 miles behind or 50 miles behind enemy lines uh, to get his son-in-law and it fails miserably. But eventually his son-in-law is rescued and his son, John Waters, would eventually also rise to four-star general, son-in-law would rise to four-star general uh, in the years to come. His son, George Patton, the fourth ends up a major general, ends up commanding the second armored division in Vietnam, I think it was. Um, so that was pretty cool. A lot of legacy there that continues. Um, so, you know, it, the bottom line is Patton was, was right about Russia as far as them being our enemy in the post-war world. Um, he didn't, he refused to denazify. He felt that by removing every single person who had been a Nazi, um, that Germany would fall apart. Uh, and so he kept, when he was put in charge, he was made the military governor of Bavaria. And when he was put in charge of Bavaria, he kept Nazis in a lot of key positions. And this was not something that Eisenhower was going to stand for. Uh, and he made a lot of comments like basically he didn't really say it this way, but the way it got spun was that he was basically saying that there was no difference between Democrats and Republicans in the United States and Nazis. What he really said was that some people weren't really diehard Nazis. They just paid lip service to the Nazi party so they could keep their position. And that was what he tried to say, but it got spun as him saying that the Nazis were no different than Republicans or Democrats, which wasn't really what he meant. Um, so um, let me just catch up on the chat here. So he ends up, because of these incidents, getting removed as commander of the 3rd Army. He gets put in command of the 15th Army, which is basically not really a combat unit or an occupation force. It's basically a, an army that's basically a bunch of people who are compiling the history of the war. And at this point, Patton makes his plans to go back to the United States. He's probably going to retire. He's hoping maybe he can get some kind of a training command, but he's most likely going to retire, and then he's going to write a book or something. And he actually starts writing a book. He writes the first 10 pages or so. Um, and uh, he did have a beef with Monty, but I think it was more of a rivalry with Monty uh, and a mutual respect. Definitely an old soul. I agree with that 100%. Um, and so a couple of days before he's set to fly home to the United States. He's going hunting. And uh, this is literally like two or three days before he's to fly home. He's, he's going hunting. Uh, and so he's in a car uh, to, to go on this hunting trip with his uh, chief of staff and a few other people. And the story goes that uh, at very slow speeds, a truck pulls in front of them and their car hits this truck. Nobody else in either vehicle has a scratch on them. Nobody else gets hurt. They're not going that fast. It wasn't a serious accident. And like I said, nobody else in the cars gets hurt. But Patton gets thrown forward in the car. He scrapes his head on the light on the roof of the car, and it peels back like it exposes his skull. It peels back part of his scalp. And he snaps his neck like between the third and fourth cervical vertebrae breaks his neck. He's instantly paralyzed. He's bleeding really bad from the scalp wound. Uh, and it's just such a weird thing because, no, like I said, nobody else was hurt, but Patton is hurt severely. Uh, and this, of course, is where the controversy comes in uh, because he's taken to the hospital. He's put in traction. He seems to be recovering. I shouldn't say recovering. He's not getting feeling back. Uh, the prognosis is not good. They fly in some of the best uh, doctors in the world, including a, a guy from Oxford. Uh, General Eisenhower, who by this point has gone back to the States, and actually Patton, for a couple of weeks, was actually the overall commander in Europe once Eisenhower left. It was temporary, but he was the overall commander in Europe uh, because of his rank. Uh, Eisenhower gives Patton's wife uh, a car or a plane uh, to allow her to, to fly over to see him. And I should mention that one of the people who's by Patton's side during this time is his niece by marriage. So she's not blood relative of his. She's a niece by marriage. Um, and he may have been having an affair with her. 
Uh, Patton definitely had a lot of affairs. In fact, uh, in the post-war, he's 60 years old. He takes leave in London and he brags to his chief of staff that he's taking nine condoms with him because he's going to need them. And he tells him later that he ended up using four of them. Um, so there was a lot of this going on and Patton was known to have kind of slept around quite a bit during his marriage. Um, and he, so he may have had an affair with this, this, uh, niece by marriage. And in fact, two weeks after she, after he dies, uh, of his injuries, she commits suicide back in the United States, this niece. Um, so yeah, so, uh, you know, just a little bit, uh, Adrian, thanks for coming by. Glad you could join us for this. Um, so then he's in traction. He's got a broken neck. He's paralyzed from the neck down. Um, they've actually got tongs under his cheekbones that are pulling on him as he's laying there. And you can imagine how uncomfortable that was. But they say he was a model patient. He was very kind to the nurses and the doctors. Always did what he was asked of him. Didn't show any of that kind of gruff, uh, rough exterior. Was very kind to everybody in the hospital. Um, recognized that his situation was not good. And at one point he asked his chief of staff, he said, be honest with me. Am I ever going to be able to ride a horse again? And they told him no. And he said, okay, well, thank you for your honesty. Uh, so he understood he probably wasn't going to recover from this. And so a lot of people, this has given rise to the argument that he was assassinated by the Russians uh, or by other Americans to keep him quiet about what he was saying about the Russians. Uh, officially, he dies of a pulmonary embolism um, right before they were going to fly him home to the United States because everybody understood he was probably going to die. And for PR reasons, which is dumb to me, they wanted him to die in the United States and not in Germany. Uh, but he dies uh, at the end of December, a couple of weeks after the accident. Um, he dies, I think, December 29th. They bury him. Uh, in the American cemetery in Hom Luxembourg, which is where a lot of his third army troops are buried. He's in, he's initially buried where all the other soldiers are buried. He's just the next one in line in the rows. But so many people visit his grave in the cemetery over the next couple of years that they actually exhume his body and put it at the head of the cemetery as if he's the head uh, overlooking all of his troops. Uh, so that's where you find him to this day. And so I'll pull up a picture of his grave now. <laughs> All right, I think we're back up. Let me know if you uh, if you hear me if I'm back up again. All right, we're, we're good. Sorry about that. I don't know what in the world's going on today. Uh, my daughter had an issue with her stream as well, so there's obviously something going on. I might have to run a landline up here. Um, so uh, I don't know where I was when I lost you, but uh, my plan uh, is to continue uh, to do these reaction videos, to do chat videos like this where we talk about historic topics. Uh, so... Let me know if you have a particular topic, not now, but let me know on the channel um, if there's a particular topic you'd like me to do one of these streams about sometime. Uh, but I also uh, have plans to go to Europe uh, and make videos from some of these sites where these things happened. And you can help with that. Uh, Insane and our other mods uh, on Discord have set up a GoFundMe account to help uh, fund my trip uh, to be able to go to Europe and make these videos. The link's in the description below. So if you are able to uh, and you are willing uh, and able, I know COVID has hit a lot of people hard, the link's in the description. You can help out in that way. It's a great way to donate, uh, and YouTube doesn't take any of it when you donate that way. So, um, so this is his grave at the head of his troops in Luxembourg at the American Cemetery there. That's where he's buried to this day. Um, and there's actually a video on YouTube. I'm afraid to show it, but if you look it up, there's actually a video of Eisenhower visiting Patton's grave uh, afterward. Um, I would love to come to Finland someday. That would be very cool. Um, but I, that's really about all I have. Uh, I don't know if you guys have any specific comments or questions, excuse me, about Patton. Uh, anything you want to talk about as we wrap this up? 
What did Patton think of Rommel? I think Patton thought very highly of Rommel uh, as a commander. I, I don't remember uh, reading anything otherwise. I know in his journal he talked about Rommel uh, and his respect for Rommel as a commander. Uh, Liverpool would love Liverpool. Uh, definitely a place I'd like to go. A lot of places in the UK I would love to go someday. Definitely Germany as well. Uh, Germany is one of the countries very high on my list. Uh, and when I visit Europe and I go to some of these World War One and World War II battlefields, I want to visit um, not only American and Allied cemeteries, I want to visit some of the German war, uh, war cemeteries as well. Uh, I've got some of those marked on the map. Uh, can we get a quick book review? So yeah, let me talk about the book uh, that I just did. Let me pull it up for a second here. Um, so I can let you know the information on the book that I just uh, went through. I actually did it on Audible because uh, I'm in the car a lot. Uh, so I listen to books on uh, on Audible. Um, actually, the one I'm doing now, and I'll show you this as well before I get to the one about Patton. Uh, this is the one I'm doing now, uh, which is called 47 Days by Mitchell Yockelson. Uh, and it's the... Um, it's the story of the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. Uh, I guess you probably can't see it very well, but um, let me see if I can pull it up for you on here. Uh, this is the book that I'm doing right now. It's called 47 Days, How Pershing's Warriors Came of Age to Defeat the German Army, Army in World War I. Uh, it's about the Americans and the, and the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, and, and it's a, a part of history I want to learn more about because I'm planning to visit those places in Europe when I get the chance. But um, more to the, to the point. Oh, Poland? Yes, I would love to visit Poland, especially Auschwitz. That's a place I want to go, and I, I love Poland, I think, very highly. Uh, of Poland as a nation and uh, the history of that uh, nation. But Patton by Martin. So are we back? I think we're back. I don't know what's going on, guys. We're going to wrap it up here in just a minute just because uh, we're having a lot of struggles. But um, so this is the book that I just read. It's uh, Patton, The Man Behind the Legend by Martin Blumenson. Uh, and it, I have nothing to compare it to because I haven't read any other biographies of Patton. But it was about 10 hours long, the audiobook version of it. Very good look into his whole life, not just uh, World War II. I think it was a very balanced look at everything from his birth and his upbringing to World War I to the interwar period to World War II. Gives you a lot of insight into the man as well as the military. Uh, so I highly recommend it if you're looking for something to learn more about Patton. Uh, I think it was a really well done. Um, yes, Blue Orion's absolutely right. I would love to visit every one of the places you guys have just suggested. And the more this channel grows, the more the opportunities will present themselves uh, for that to happen. So thank you guys so much for being a part of this stream. I apologize again for the issues that we had. Um, Hopefully we'll get that all sorted out before we do another stream. Uh, so thank you. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't already. Continue the conversation over on Patreon, over on Discord. Uh, check out the links in the description below. We will definitely do this again. Uh, thanks a lot. You guys have a great weekend.